Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last month, a Falcon 9 took off, carrying not one, but two lunar landers for private companies. Now, the first one, the primary payload, was Firefly's Blue Ghost Lander. They're based out of Texas. The second spacecraft was iSpace's Hakuto-R, or Resilience. Now, these spacecraft are both currently making their way to the moon by a slow path. Firefly has finally reached lunar orbit, and Hakuto-R is headed off to the Lagrange point so it can pick up some more energy and come back to the moon a little more slowly. But before either of these lands, we're going to get another spacecraft launched towards the moon. Intuitive machines are going to launch their second lander, Athena. Now, as I said, all three spacecraft are from private companies. They're carrying payloads to the lunar surface for customers. And two of them are specifically carrying a lot of payloads for NASA under the CLIPS program. That would be Firefly and Intuitive Machines. Now, the third one from iSpace, they're actually carrying stuff for like sponsors and stuff in Japan, but they are also going to be part of the CLIPS program in a future uh, mission. So CLIPS is NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, and it was something that spawned in 2018, essentially to try to do for lunar transport what the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services System did for low Earth orbit. That, of course, caught that gave rise to SpaceX as the powerhouse it is today. SpaceX had more or less been playing around with Falcon 1, baby's first rocket, and uh, when they got the contract for the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services so they could actually send stuff to the space station, that was when Falcon 9 was dreamed up and you know, SpaceX basically bet big on that and won. And so Clips, in many ways, is similar to this. Instead of paying to take stuff to orbit, they're paying for stuff to be taken to the surface of the moon. And NASA isn't having a whole lot of influence on exactly how the lander is designed. And NASA is primarily making sure that if it's putting an experiment on one of these missions, that the experiment can function as designed. For example, if there's going to be a rover, there needs to be a way to deploy the rover onto the surface. So as of right now, the NASA CLIPS website lists 14 companies which can bid on these potential contracts. And there's a whole range of capabilities and design decisions between these. Like, yes, you do have small things like Astrobotic with their little peregrine lander or blue origin with their slightly bigger blue moon but then in the bottom left you'll see that spacex has basically said if we can ship it up there via starship we'll do it you'll also notice Mastin space systems now they were a pretty cool company for a long time doing you know neat stuff with vertically landing rockets and, and landers they were well positioned to do this kind of uh, lunar landing technology, but after getting awarded a contract, they went bankrupt, and now their uh, all their former assets are now owned by Astrobotic, and the mission that they were awarded has since been cancelled. And then there's Orbit Beyond, who were awarded a contract very early on, and then subsequently cancelled it when they decided that they were not going to be able to meet the deadline or the schedule that was required by NASA. And on the flip side, we have Astrobotics Griffin Lander, which was contracted to deliver NASA's Viper rover to the moon. So that was all paid for. NASA has agreed to you know, send a payload on the lander, except NASA has cancelled the rover because it went over budget. But one of the reasons it went over budget was because they required extra changes to the lander so that it would be more reliable. And that meant that the lander was delayed and then the rover was delayed and everything ended up costing more. And now we're sending a lander to the surface of the moon without the rover it was supposed to carry. And there is definitely an argument for cancelling projects that are going way over budget, but then again, that argument doesn't include the fact that we're still paying to deliver something to the surface of the moon. And that is definitely a case of a CLIPS delivering something that isn't necessarily what it promised. And so let's talk about what CLIPS has delivered. There's been two missions so far. The first one was the Peregrine Lander from uh, Astrobotic. Now, Astrobotic, their history with lunar landers goes right back to the Google Lunar X Prize. That's supposed to be like a competition where companies would get a prize for being the first to land on the moon and then demonstrate a traverse across the surface. So Peregrine was a 1.3 ton spacecraft that could deliver a 
a couple of hundred kilograms to the lunar surface. The propulsion system used a hypergolic monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. There would be five engines for landing and like another dozen or so engines which were used for attitude control. And being the first launch of the CLIPS program, it was hoped that this would be the first American spacecraft to land softly on the moon for a very long time. And it would also be the first spacecraft to launch on a Vulcan rocket. Yes, so it debuted last year, uh, January 8th, 2024. It was expected to get injected into a transfer orbit that went all the way out to the moon. It would perform one and a half orbits before the moon captured it. It would perform insertion burns and eventually land on the surface of the moon in a region called the Gruthusen Domes. But unfortunately, the high hopes were dashed when a helium regulator failed. A helium regulator was supposed to maintain the pressure in the propellant tanks at a certain level, but when the regulator failed, the helium just kept flowing in until it got to a pressure level, which caused the tanks to rupture. So the spacecraft was left in space without any propulsion and eventually fell back to Earth about 10 days after its launch. And so the CLIPS program didn't get off to a great start, but NASA had said that they were expecting some failures and they were willing to tolerate this if it would bring a lower cost you know, mechanism for getting to the surface of the moon. So anyway, the second spacecraft in the program, the second launch was Intuitive Machines with their IM-1 lander, also known as Odysseus. And this launched on the 15th of February, 2024. And Intuitive Machines launch number two is happening on 28th of February in a few days time. So this spacecraft was undeniably a pioneer. This was going to be the first spacecraft to attempt to land on the lunar surface using cryogenic propellants. The main engine on this ran on methane and liquid oxygen. Every other spacecraft that has soft landed on the moon has used storable hypergolics. So it launched on a dedicated Falcon 9 that injected the spacecraft into a you know, direct lunar transit orbit. Because it was running with cryogenic propellants, they had to make the trip from the Earth to the Moon relatively quickly to reduce fuel boil off. Seven days later, they were attempting their land on, landing on the Moon, but not before they had encountered some interesting problems. Critically, the landing system required on a LIDAR, a laser, which would be measuring the distance to the surface of the moon, and somehow a checklist hadn't been followed, and this laser was physically locked out from being activated on the spacecraft, so they were not able to activate the landing system as they designed it. Now, the team worked very quickly to make it use a laser system which was actually an experiment that was on board and use some data from that to help them get down to the surface but even then they were still left without required instrumentation and ultimately when they did land they were going just a little bit too fast and the rover legs broke and it fell over. But that wasn't the end of the mission. Although the antennas were pointing the wrong way, they were ab actually able to establish communications with the spacecraft and get some of the data back, including this image showing the landing legs in the process of breaking as it fell over. And so a little more than a year later, we are waiting for the second launch by Intuitive Machines. IM2 Athena it is going to be launching by the end of this week, and I expect that by now somebody has made sure that the LiDAR is properly enabled and not physically locked out. They'll have probably worked on their software and their checklists to make sure they don't mess this one up. Again, it's going to launch on a dedicated Falcon 9, and when it does, we should have three different lunar landers on the way to the moon. And while Athena is going to perform a fast flight to the moon and a rapid landing because of that cryogenic propellant, it's not likely to get to the surface of the moon before Firefly. Firefly's Blue Ghost was launched a month ago and it's been spending its time slowly getting into lunar orbit, checking out those systems. They have the luxury to work through these problems and make sure that everything is, is checked out. And... and I saw the core of Blue Ghost a year ago when I visited Firefly in Texas. And it's always cool when uh, something that you've been in the physical presence of finally makes it into space. Now, the Blue Ghost design is radically different, again, from Intuitive Machines' design. 
You'll notice that compared to Intuitive Machines design, it's much shorter and flatter. And to be clear, it's still taller than me, but it has solar panels sitting on top of it. Whereas the Intuitive Machines uh, spacecraft, they tend to be taller because the solar panels on the side are better for operating at the po lunar poles. Blue Ghost is going to marry Chrysium, which has a, a latitude of like 17 degrees. Firefly are also experts in carbon fiber composites and the, the most of the structure on Blue Ghost is made of this carbon fiber. And I'm sure there's a lot of other components that are built in house. For example, the RCS thrusters, they are called Spectres. There's eight of those that are on the spacecraft. They use a bipropellant mix of MON and, and you know, hydrazine. But the main engine is a Leros 4 developed by NAMO. So that is a, an existing engine design. The solar panels are from Rocket Lab, as are a bunch of other avionics and software. And I presume that this has led uh, Firefly to be able to keep the cost relatively low. Now, we don't know how much money Firefly have spent developing this and building this, but we do know that NASA is paying just over $100 million for the ride, in addition to the $45 million it pays for the various experiments that are going to fly. One of the most obvious ones is called LEXI. It's the Lunar Environment Heliospheric X-ray Imager. It's basically an X-ray telescope that is uh, exists or it sits on top of the spacecraft. It's going to point back at the magnetosphere around the Earth and look for you know energetic photons coming from the magnetic reconnection events. But going the other direction, you have LISTER, the Lunar Instrumentation for Subsurface Thermal Exploration with Rapidity, which is, okay, somebody clearly is a Red Dwarf fan because this drills down into the ground and uh, yet yeah, it's going to look for like thermal, you know, how uh, heat transmits out of the lunar surface. There's experiments that look at lunar regolith, first to see what it sticks to, and another experiment which tries to see if they can vacuum it up, you're right, the Lunar Planet Vac. But the experiment that I am most interested in is called SCALPS, Stereo Cameras for Lunar Plume Surface Studies. And what this is basically is they are looking at how the exhaust plume from this rocket engine is going to interact with the lunar surface. And that means it's going to have a lot of high frame rate cameras from different angles doing analysis. This is basically going to be, you know, rocket exhaust porn. One of the things that's most poorly understood about landing on the moon is how rocket exhausts interact with the surface of the moon. So having multiple cameras on this is going to be important. This is If you're looking on sending spacecraft to the moon with any regularity, you're going to want to understand this in extreme detail. And this particular problem is not something that is easy to model in computers. That's why we have to have a real experiment doing this. There are also other experiments which have already been running. There's a, an experiment to use the existing GPS or GNSS navigation systems from lunar orbit because those uh, navigation signals are beamed at the Earth. They sp you know, spill off into space in all sorts of directions and those can still be used to help navigate. And that experiment has already demonstrated this capability. But yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that Blue Ghost lands successfully. Third time lucky, right? That's what we say. Uh, it will get some amazing photos and it'll be fantastic to watch this happen. And then days later, we're going to get IM2 uh, Athena landing on the surface too. So uh, it's possible that we have two different spacecraft from two different uh, clips providers operating on the moon at the same time. And even after night falls and both these spacecraft shut down and probably don't wake up again, we'll have uh, iSpace's Hakuto-R. It will be swinging past Lagrange Point, eventually returning to the moon and landing. And iSpace, they are also involved in the CLIPS program with Draper. They're going to build the Series 2 lander for Draper, which I think is aimed for 2026. But before that happens, we're going to have the first Griffin mission from Astrobotic, which is now carrying an entirely different rover, the Flex rover. And we're going to have IM3 from Intuitive Machines. So we'll have another Intuitive Machines lander. And looking further into the future, there are more Blue Ghost and uh, Intuitive Machines Nova lander missions that we should expect. 
After two flights and half a success, I'm really hoping that we start to see consistent success from these missions because, um, you know, obviously there's suddenly a lot of questions as to what happens in terms of funding. And it's obviously easier to get things funded if they're being successful. And on an even more basic level, I met a lot of people that were working on these various projects at parties recently, and I want them to have another excuse to party rather than an excuse to, you know, drown their sorrows. So, look, <laughs> that may be a shallow take, but I am sincere in wishing best of luck to everyone that's trying to land rovers on the moon. I hope this is going to be a year of great successes. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.